Good afternoon, all the viewers. We are here. Um, radio astronomy outreach session as a tribute to Professor Govind Karu, father of radio astronomy in India. And we have with us um, panel members who are radio astronomers who have been colleagues of Professor Goin Sarup, and um, we all are here to pay our tribute to Professor Sarup. And in this session, what we would be uh, having is that we we would be playing a few recorded video segments from Professor Sarup, which we had taken here at our Nehru Planetarium a few years ago. And in a kind of an outreach, he, he always wanted to reach out to everyone, every, particularly every young person who was interested in astronomy and get them to be excited about radio astronomy. And we would be, be playing some of these segments. And in a little while, we'll be also be joined by Professor Anantha Krishnan, so radio astronomer who has been colleague of Professor Swaroop over this entire period from the very beginnings of radio astronomy journey. And so we would be starting with some of these presentations. And I would just uh, like to mention, we have with us on the panel, Professor Divya Abirai, Professor Yogesh Vagadekar, Professor Dhruva Saikya, all of them with long association with the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, which has built up the GMRT, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope, Professor Amitava Sen Gupta, associated with the National Phys Physical Laboratories, which also had a very beginning connection with Professor Goin Sarup's radio astronomy endeavors here in India. And I would be... Carl Jansky in the United States, Bell Telephone Laboratory, discovered in 1932 that radio waves are coming from the direction of our galaxy and not much got done soon after. During the World War II, great discoveries took place in electronics, radar, modern equipment. So after the war, people started searching for radio waves from the sky. In 1953, I went to Australia where there was a beginning of radio astronomy. Some discoveries were being made. I was really fascinated by this field, radio waves were discovered from the directions of very, very distant objects in our sky, much more distant than anything known before through visual telescopes, through optical telescopes. Certain galaxies, uh, there are the giant black holes. There, in our own galaxy, the supernova remnant at the end of a history of a star, when a star runs out of fuel great big explosion take place and supernova remnant you cite to radio waves. So there are ex many ex uh, outstanding explosive events in the universe which are sources of radio waves. Well, I came back from Stanford University in 1963 and Dr. Homi Baba, the father of Atomic Energy in India and who built the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He invited, he started he, a good formation of a radio story group in Tata Institute. And uh, he had written to me when I was at Stanford University that if you meet our expectation, we can have much bigger equipment. So, whilst uh, 1963, there was a great big controversy how our universe is formed. There was a theory Hubble had said, further away galaxy, faster is moving away. That means to begin with all galaxies, all stars, all of us were in a tiny, tiny point. And then Big Bang took place. And that's what the universe is. But Fred Hoyle from England, Cambridge, he said, well, why the matter has to be created right in the beginning? Maybe it gets created all the time in all places in the world. So it was a great big controversy. She talked to me with Dr. Hervey Baba's great vision for India, that I should do something truly outstanding. So I got an idea of building a large radio telescope in southern India, taking advantage of India's closeness to Earth's equator. 
So that's how the bending of radio astronomy, and I built the OT radio telescope. After a lot of search, we found a hill in Uttakaman in South India, which is a in the north-south direction. It is a slope of 11 degrees, which is the same inclination as the latitude of the station. That means the, uh, the uh, that means the parabolic cylinder which it telescope, which you see in the picture here, has. Uh, the north end is towards the north pole, the south end points towards the south pole, of course, below the earth. So, in that sense, the parabolic cylinder, the long axis of rotation, is parallel to the axis of earth. So, as we rotate the telescope, we can follow the source continuously. In the north-south direction, as we want to see various north-south direction, we use electronic phasing which change the delay line. There are a thousand dipoles at the focus of the parabolic cylinder. I mean, instead of a heating rod on a heater, which you see in North India in the winter time, instead of that, there are a thousand dipoles at the focus of the focal line of the parabolic cylinder. And by changing the length of cables from each cable, from each to the receiver room, you can point it to the north-south direction, some direction. And then by, by rotation, you can follow the moon. So why this elaborate thing? Because we wanted to measure angular sizes of radio sources to distinguish between the Big Bang and steady state theory of the formation of the universe and a unique challenge at that time. And uh, most radio galaxies are double radius sources. As moon moves in the sky, it first eclipses or occult occultation, as we say, it first eclipses one of the double one part of double radius source, the second part. And later on, after half an hour or 20 minutes, the moon has moved away and the sources come, the two double sources then again come out. So by that we are able to measure angular size of radio sources. And then during the next, the telescope was conceived 63, completed 1970. It was the first radio telescope built in India. It was very large, it is still existing. In, in a beautiful hill of Utakaman. Uh, it had four times the area of the famous Jordan Bank radio telescope in England. And it's still doing extraordinary experiments. It has discovered many pulsating radio sources and also everyday measures scintillation of uh, Quasars and other point sources to measure the velocity of the solar wind taking place, particularly after big flares. Uh, the solar wind comes sometimes. If the great big storms take place, we call cold and steamers. If they hit the earth, they affect the communication, they hurt the satellites. So, the telescope is one of the unique instruments in the world in working today for advance warning of such solar storms. Well, Uti Radio Telescope became functional in 1970. And uh, it occurred to me, there were, of course, in science, there are always new questions, new theories, new challenges. And uh, whatever we know is so little. There's always a, there are theories who have ideas what, what is their theories are great people. But on the other hand, unless we do experiment, unless we do observations, how do we know what's the truth? So it occurred to me to build a much larger telescope, two kilometer long, 50 meter wide. 
So I propose it building a giant equatorial radio telescope at the Earth's equator in Kenya. And it was approved by UNESCO, by government of India agreed to give half the cost. But then Kiriata, the founder, president, founder of Kenya, he died during the negotiations. They went to Indonesia, but then the earthquake is there, a lot more. So finally, we talked, we had designed Now the bigger challenge took place by the by 1970s micro background had been 1965 micro background had been found which is a subject by itself and so the question to Big Bang it was very clear from our experiments at UT and also by discovery of micro background that the universe was formed by Big Bang and not by steady state and Big Bang. Matter is supposed to have been originated right from the very beginning. And uh, is there only our universe? That's a different subject. There may be other universes like ours. And, um, but then the question comes in, what was before the stars and galaxies? So according to the Big Bang, when the universe was about a temperature of about billion degrees or 10 million degrees, electrons and protons got formed because the temperature has similar energy as required to form electrons and protons. And later on the universe was expanding. So electrons and protons and what you may call gas of elementary particles it cooled and later on one electron, one proton forms hydrogen gas. So to begin with there was only 75% hydrogen gas and 25% helium of course in extremely vapor stage but then it cooled. When it cooled it started collapsing but if you keep on cooling clumps take place. So when, because the universe is, the gases are rotating, they collide with each other and they form clumps by gravitation. The gravitation is a very powerful force. So by gravitation, electrons and protons combine together, if they're cooled enough, they form the gas. So by 1980s, it became very clear that uh, that is a way galaxies and stars form. Now, if it is true, we have to find these hydrogen clouds before stars and galaxies, because then we will be able to show how stars and galaxies form. Now, hydrogen, cold hydrogen, is so cold, it does not give, give rise to light, but it has a unique signature. It gives rise to it. radiation at 21 centimeter wavelength or what we call 1420 megahertz cycle, about uh, 100 times, about 10 times shorter wavelength than that of FM station. And so electrons and protons, they both spin around each other and they say they're like little magnets and if they flip, they fly to this wavelength. So there no other radio telescope existed in the world to search for such massive hydrogen clouds. And uh, so once we were very successful at UT and we have formed a powerful group building everything locally nothing imported except instruments, basic things like transistors. Uh, we had a now a mastery on the subject. So I conceived first of the giant equatorial telescope 
that I could not build, could not find a suitable site elsewhere in India. So I conceived a giant meter wave radio telescope to be built somewhere in India, like a Y array, like an inframeter. Yes, so uh, we heard uh, from Professor Koinsarup about the beginnings and evolution of astro radio astronomy in India through the Uti radio telescope and the Jain Meteor radio telescope coming up. We have a galaxy of astronomers with us uh, who are going to answer all the queries any of you students may have who are going to take us through the dynamics of these two uh, radio telescopes which have been set up. We have with us Professor Subra Anantakrishnan who has been a long uh, co colleague from the very beginnings of the uh, radio astronomy uh, endeavors in India. And uh, we would be requesting Professor Anantakrishnan to walk us through those early days and bringing us up to the creation of the GMRT and then all of the panel, we would be requesting them to give their inputs as well as I would just suggest to all the students who are watching, you can type your questions in the chat, use the chat for your queries so that it can be utilized effectively. We can find the questions and get the answers from the pan galaxy the panel that we have. Professor Anand Krishnan, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nusri. Can, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Already over there. Uh, yes, you are, you are audible. Professor Anand Krishnan, you are audible. Hello. Hello. Give me a... uh, yeah, we can Hello. we can hear you. We can hear you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. There, there seems to be some connectivity problem. Uh, I don't know whether it is from your side. I, I think so, because uh, here it is uh, quite clear, uh, but uh, uh, it is there. Okay. Yes, so please I, go I, ahead. I, please I, go ahead. We are able yeah, to hear you. Uh, yeah. The other panel members are also able to hear Professor Anand Krishnan. Right? Yeah, yes, we can hear you quite clearly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a moment. I, <laughs> something, got, something got entangled. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there are there are students here in the audience. Uh, Ratnasri? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, okay. for the link to this session has been mostly sent for for college teachers to inform the students. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, I'm. Uh, deeply sorry that uh, Professor Gonsuru is no more with us. Uh, he was uh, he was simply great. Uh, my association went back to him, went back to uh, goes back to uh, 1966, a long time ago, about 54 years ago, uh, when I joined him in 1966, and uh, uh, he was uh, he was already very reputed. He had a degree from Stanford, and he was on the faculty of Stanford, and he came and joined uh, TAFR three years earlier. And uh, he had built, uh, he was building the Kalyan radio telescope uh, with which I was supposed to work. Uh, but then I was uh, immediately diverted away to uh, building the electronics for the Uri telescope uh, because of my background. And so, therefore, the journey began, and uh, we built the electronics and went to, uh, it took about two years, and went to uh, Uti. And we had uh, some very illustrious uh, colleagues 
प्रोफेसर बी सी शर्मा एंड मोहन जोशी एंड देन यंग फलोज लाइक विजय कपाही एंड दुर्गा बागरी एंड रमेश सिन्हा एंड मेरे स्वामी एंड बाल सुब्रमण्यन एंड माई सेल्फ वी फॉर्म द कोर थीम विच बेसिकली बिल्ट द उडियो टेलीस्कोप and uh, he was uh, he was uh, a very dynamic leader and uh, he he just uh, pushed us to work and work and work and we would sit late till late in the night and discuss but the beautiful thing was there was uh, argument and uh, we could uh, we could give our views and he would listen and he would argue and so on so the atmosphere was uh, very interesting and very invigorating and so we all learned together and i think the uti telescope was a great big experiment and very successful experiment it had its own failures uh, it fell down in uh, 1971 we had to toil again for two years to bring it back again to normal and this is not known to even people in the group uh, later of the later years uh, but finally it became a very successful telescope and it has been working for the last uh, almost 50 years uh, we recently celebrated the 50th birthday of the uti telescope so it is a well well you are going too too fast i think ratnasri i think you are going too fast <laughs> yeah previous one please yes yeah okay no can you can you show it in full yeah so all of you are fairly uh, all of you are likely to have seen the night sky uh, uh, full of uh, stars visible on the dark moonless night on some country roads one time or another and you can see this uh, you can see that Uh, in fact there are sometimes there are uh, there are comets as you can see in the next slide yeah not this one the next one i think yeah right here so roughly about 2000 stars you can see in the night if it is a clear sky and you can see some galaxies like andromeda if you know where to look and the sky looks uh, so very beautiful but you may not be aware that the the sky is also full of uh, cosmic objects which emit at other different frequencies uh, and other wavelengths corresponding wavelengths so in the next slide i think we have uh, we have a picture of the uh, entire spectrum no it is gone yeah just keep it there uh, entire spectrum which is uh, having uh, having gamma ray on the left side two uh, radio waves on the right side of the picture and you can see some uh, space uh, satellites up there uh, which are in the gamma ray portion and the x-ray portion and then the very small optical window uh, is this full screen are you seeing the full screen yeah okay no I, I i want the full screen yeah uh, yeah when i am putting put full, screen, full screen yeah i will be yeah, putting it screen. in full screen i am not able yeah. to access the studio at that time i'll put it in full screen yeah okay uh, so this is uh, but the optical window if you look at the optical window uh, you will find that that is only stretching over a very short uh, wavelength span it goes from roughly about 380 nanometer to 760 nanometer this is a 2 is to 1 window but we have a much much bigger window on the right hand side after you pass through the uh, infrared uh, several micron wavelengths and then the millimeter wavelengths and uh, these are uh, these are not easily accessible from the earth so you have to fly satellites so we have infrared satellites these days uh, which are with infrared telescopes but then we come to a portion which is a big portion which you can see which is something like 10000 to 1 range over which we can receive radio waves 
So radio waves are uh, at lower frequency and long wavelength comparatively in the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, it is this sky which, is, which we are after. We are trying to understand because we have a wide variety, a wide uh, frequency range in which put telescopes of, uh, at different wavelengths. And this is what we will be talking about today. Uh, but in the next slide, we, yes. So radio waves, uh, we use it as a tool to receive very weak signals emanating from the sun, the stars and galaxies, objects like quasars, pulsars and various other objects, exotic objects. They, they are not sensitive to the human eye, obviously, because they are very, uh, very large wavelength compared to the eye size. And they are detected using radio receivers, uh, much like the FM radio, which uh, Professor Sorum talked a little earlier. But since these are highly sensitive and sophisticated, these radio receivers are actually called radio telescope because they include a very large antenna and then they, uh, they, the signals are brought to a complex set of electronics and then digitally, uh, nowadays, digitally recorded. But in old days, it used to be on chart recorders. Much like the, if any of you have visited uh, an, uh, a doctor uh, who takes an ECG, electrocardiogram, then you would see charts, fast moving charts. And so similar chart recorders we used to use uh, in 1970 and record these signals. So that is how the first observations of the OT telescope was made. So using such uh, radio telescopes, one can study many exotic objects in the universe and several Nobel Prizes have been given for such work and about which maybe some of the panelists can and will be talking later. So in the next slide, we, we go through the first uh, things, glimmers of uh, this radio sky when uh, Karl Jansky, an engineer in the electronics engineer in the Bell Labs, was asked to study the uh, study the noise which is uh, coming from uh, various equipments, and so he built an antenna which you can see in this background, and uh, he found that there are lots of uh, different kinds of noises, but one noise in particular, which is shown in the bottom rectangle. Can you go to the next uh, click? Uh, and uh, yeah, in this, in this slide, if you see, uh, there is a peak coming and the interval is uh, a day, roughly. So he marked these arrows uh, like this. He was a very careful engineer. And so he got uh, a number which is very surprising to him. It was 23 hours, 56 minutes and four seconds. And that is very unusual. Uh, people had not uh, quite understood what it was uh, because it was not 24 hours. So if it was 24 hours, you can understand it is one, one solar day to the next solar day. And But this was slightly short of that. And it was very precise. It was 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4 seconds, day after day after day. So Jansky asked uh, various people around and he met an astronomer who told him that, ah, that is the sidereal time. That is the time which a star takes to come back into the field of view of a, a telescope. If you put an optical telescope and you look at one star one day, let us say Sirius, and you see the same Sirius the next day at the same time, you won't find it. It has already gone. But it would have crossed the telescope here, uh, cross hairs at 20, for 3 minutes 56 seconds earlier. So every day it comes a little uh, earlier and that is because the earth is moving around the, the, the sun, is orbiting the sun and it moves approximately one degree because it has to move 360 60 degrees in 365 days. So it's a little less than a degree and that is exactly what Jansky was seeing. And so he hit on a great big discovery. He discovered radio waves coming from the sky and not from the earth. And that was, uh, that was splashed in New York Times in 1931 and it became a big news. People thought that maybe some 
aliens are trying to communicate with us. But very soon it became evident that it is from the center of our galaxy. So Zhansky was pulled out of this project by the Bell Labs uh, because they thought this was a waste of time. And so uh, <laughs> radio astronomy did not bloom till a very enterprising uh, Grote Reber, who was also an amateur uh, engineer astronomer uh, who used to work in his backyard. He heard of this discovery and he said, ah, oh, this is, looks very interesting. So let me build a parabolic dish antenna for this purpose. But he, uh, being an astronomer, semi-astronomer at least, so he built an antenna which was working at much higher frequencies uh, because, uh, because of uh, technical reasons, uh, it can be done by using a small uh, dish. Uh, we, will, we will discuss this a little bit uh, later. And he mapped the radio sky and he found the same thing that Jansky found, but he found a lot more details and there are maps which are being uh, seen in this uh, at the top uh, top quadrangle. You can see the maps, the contour maps. These are contours of radio intensity. And uh, so that tells that it is a big blob which you, which you are seeing. And this is actually the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And the rest of the things are rather weak for his telescope. And so they were not seen. And it uh, waited for better days to map the galaxy in much more detail using radio waves. And so we had the glimmerings of now a new subject called radio astronomy, which was a different uh, wavelength compared to the optical wavelength, which was known for the previous uh, hundreds of years, uh, right from the time of Galileo. And so the radio astronomy uh, subject was born and introduced into astronomy. And then this uh, this was around 1943 up to 1943. And then uh, the war was uh, raging in Europe uh, in uh, World War II. And so it had to, it ended in 1945. Uh, just, 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 uh, uh, I was born a little before that, a few years before that. Uh, and so the, the next phase of development of radio astronomy took place after the war. And then uh, many people got into it. And so this is the basic radio telescope, which you see in this uh, slide, uh, which shows a parabolic cylinder, which is receiving radio waves. And the figure is a little bit erroneous because uh, we, are, we are receiving radio waves from very far. And so they are all parallel waves. Okay, so it should have been those yellow arrows which are coming, they should have been parallel beams of light. So these parallel beams of light fall on the uh, fall on this uh, uh, dish. And uh, like all parabolic uh, surfaces do, they just focus this uh, light. For example, you use a convex lens. If you have been in school or college, this is a very standard uh, thing which we do. We focus the uh, convex lens on the on the sun, and then a spot, white hot spot, appears on the on the ground level. And if you put a paper there, it will burn. And this you can experiment yourself. So what this uh, lens is doing is to focus this uh, light, uh, collect this light and focus it, and then it becomes very uh, very strong and very detectable. And then in the case of light it sort of burns a hole in the paper. In, in this case, we are receiving radio waves from very, very far away, not even from nearby objects like the sun and other stars. We will come to sun later. Uh, but this is, uh, this will, how much time do I have, Rabnasri? Uh, <laughs> how much time do I have? Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. When I Hello. put it full screen, I'm not able Hello. to be there in the stream. So I will also request yeah. um, the panel members to be there and give uh, for this. Because when I'm putting it full screen, I'm not able to be in the stream. And uh, so, oh, yeah, I, I mean, okay, tend okay. to, yeah. 
Right. Mm. Right. I, I was just asking, how much now? time just... do I have? How much time do I have? Maybe another 15-20 so minutes? 10, 10, 10, 10, 15 minutes? Yes. <laughs> okay. Mm, okay. Yes, I'll yes. try to push through this fast. Uh, let me try. Anyway. So uh, yeah, please, is, please take yeah, take your time. Please, please, please go back to your full screen. Go back to your full screen. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is a this is a standard radio telescope setup, uh, which is uh, which is uh, consisting of a public dish, which is receiving radio waves and it is focusing it on the prime uh, focusing it on the prime focus, which you see there, and. Uh, there you keep uh, some sensitive antenna uh, like a, uh, like a horn or a dipole uh, incidentally horn was discovered by Achary Jagadish Chandra Bose in Calcutta in 1895 96 I displayed it in 1997 in royal society and so these horns can be used to collect radio waves and so such horns are used or elements type are used for various things can be used for receiving log periodic antennas, antennas can be used for receiving the radio waves and so and uh, the signals brought down you can also use as shown in this diagram like I said green reflector what is called a sub reflector and uh, is it is it still working is it still working? Yes, 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 uh, yes. Any one of the members? Yes, Hello? yeah. So, Hello? Uh, yes. Hello? Uh, Yogesh is there. Yogesh is there. And uh, uh, Professor Saikya yeah. is also there. He's, uh, Hello? So, the other panel yeah. members are all there. They're there. Yeah. And we can hear you, Anand. You should continue. Yeah. He, he, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, because it just goes and the, and the screen shifts back to yeah, right. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. yes you're Hello? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very clear. Okay. 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 Can I keep going? <laughs> yes. Please do. Yes. Okay. Yes, Anand. I think you can yeah. keep going. If there's a problem, we'll interrupt. Otherwise, you can assume that. Uh, yeah, you just, uh, hey, Yogesh, please show me your hand. I can see that then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. Uh, you, you say either, either you yeah. this or, or you say this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll, make I'll do that. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, so, uh, the in short, then you collect the, collect all these, uh, the waves become electricity basically we won't go through the physics of that but the electricity can be uh, converted so that means electric voltages we have and these electric voltages can be brought and amplified through amplifiers very sensitive amplifiers what are called radio frequency amplifiers and then uh, then detected and then recorded either in short recorder or in um, in uh, digital recorders and computer and all that and that is those are the modern evolutions when we started to begin with in 1970 we couldn't even get a computer and so it had to be all ch uh, on chart recorders and hand digitized and analyzed so it was a lot of problem in those days but we have we have gone past those days and 4k memory was a big thing in those days and today we talk very glibly of uh, 32 GB and of RAM and then uh, you know terabyte of memories and all that. So a simple radio telescope consists of only these things. But I just want you to uh, concentrate on the right hand uh, part of this diagram where I have written theta equal to lambda by d, which is wavelength divided by the aperture. Now in case you have a, a paper and pencil or a pad and a, and a pen, uh, I want you to do a little bit of calculation uh, somewhere privately by yourself, which is that if we make lambda equal to 500 nanometer and D equal to uh, 10 centimeters, which is a four inch optical telescope, then you will get the answer in terms of 
meter by meter because it is one is nanometer at the top and the other is uh, uh, centimeter at the bottom convert both of them into meter and you calculate and then you will get radians and those radians you convert into minutes which you convert into seconds of arc that is the angular uh, extent and you will get an amazing result that that is one arc second so even with a very small four inch optical telescope you can get what is called an angular resolution theta of uh, one arc seconds but on the other hand radio waves being much longer now you let us just do we have got a big dish like the gmrt which you have heard about already a 45 meter parabolic dish antenna it gives only a resolution of 1.2 degrees at a lambda of 1 meter wavelength which is corresponding to 300 megahertz uh, million cycles per second so you can do this calculation yourself this is not a great big mystery any any college student any high school students will be able to do this and uh, so you will find that the angular resolution is 4000 th times worse than a small optical telescope of uh, four inch. so this is the big problem so if you really want that same one arc second resolution you need a telescope which is some 200 kilometers in aperture you know which is impractical to build can you imagine a radio telescope extending from let us say pune to bombay something like that so th that is very impractical so that is where the whole trick uh, lies so first of all one tries to make much much bigger telescopes and that is how uh, the uti radio telescope was uh, built uh, goen sroop got a very ingenious idea of placing this telescope in such a manner that its axis became parallel to the earth's axis we don't have time to go into those details i would have loved to go into those details but we can go through the next slides very probably rapidly you know where uti is we have missed it in the previous slide and uh, which was showing the geographical location of uti but what is in uh, you can see at the bottom rectangle uh, you can see a small circle red circle and that is uti which is in nilgiris which is uh, close to the city of coimbatore and it is also close to bangalore and mysore you know it is about 200 kilometers from mysore about 100 miles and then about 50 miles from uh, from bangalore and so the next slide uh, you, can you show the yeah so this is a very sensitive innovative parabolic cylinder and that is placed on a this is half a kilometer long so we were talking 45 meters for the gmrt dish but the uti telescope itself is about a, a 10 times longer than that in one direction and the other direction this is much smaller so these are called parabolic cylinders and not uh, parabolic dishes they are long in one direction and short in the other direction and uh, it was commissioned in 1970 can we see the geometry of this yeah right mm -hmm. and the next, yes, next one. yeah i think something is got missed in the next one click on the full full screen yeah right so this is the earth uh, you can see at the bottom this is the latitude of uti which is about 11 degrees and uh, Professor Swaroop got this ingenious idea sitting in the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research Library that if we were to place a parabolic cylinder on the slope of a hill whose latitude is same as that of uh, the place, namely in this case finally Uti, uh, that is about 11 degrees 23 minutes and the slope of this hill is also 11 degrees 23 minutes and so therefore they cancelled each other and so the telescope's axis became parallel to the Earth's axis. Telescope's axis became parallel to the Earth's axis. As you can see, the, the bottom line is the axis of the Earth pointing towards the north. And you can see that the telescope is also placed uh, in the north of the direction. So merely rotating this telescope from east to west will capture a, a radio object like a star let us say an equivalent of a star let us call it uh, temporarily a radio star but we call it as a radio source to distinguish it from a star 
and uh, that radio source can be tracked for uh, you can see in this the left one and the right uh, right one next one uh, next one the full one yeah this is the full radio telescope as Sorry. you can see oh, it's going uh, yeah right as you can see this telescope is on the slope of a hill this was uh, this was i think a fantastic project in 1970 when uh, mechanical engineers and structural engineers did not know how to get accuracies of a centimeter in the erection of such telescopes we wanted about five millimeter and uh, we ended up getting about eight millimeters or so finally after a lot of effort but however this was with a small team of scientists and engineers it became possible to commission this telescope in 1970 and it, the, 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 the feed fell down after a year or year and a half due to a technical fault uh, but then it was repaired and it is it is looking like this now and it has been working for the last uh, almost 45 years or something like that sanjay from nine, nine thoda late ho sakta hai yeah right so uh, okay I, i hope i can finish it soon okay so the uti telescope has produced wonderful science which can be talked about by the panelists i will not go into the details of that it is uh, we can work on the sun we can work on uh, the the medium between the sun and the earth we can uh, discover pulsars and we can most importantly we can discover very weak uh, radio objects in the sky like quasars and uh, such objects which are very distant and it help in uh, in supplementing the theories which were already existing about the big bang model of the universe and so that was that was very exciting results uh, which came up from uti and various other things we studied like sun comets and pulsars and all that so we will go to the next slide where uh, yeah where i i go straight away to the gmrt so now we have this problem that even with the uh, telescope which is half a kilometer long it was not adequate to provide sensitivity because in one direction the uti telescope provided only 6 arc minute of uh, uh, angular beam you can calculate it very easily because the operating frequency of uh, uti was about 300 megahertz so which is 1 meter again which we had already calculated but now we had in one direction 530 meters half a kilometer so you put simply 1 by 500 and you will find the number about 6 arc minute 6 6.5 arc minute very easily so we had to change this whole idea we operated uh, uti telescope for about 10 years and then we started vigorously arguing about what we need to produce a radio array which will be a mammoth sized radio array and which will be the most sensitive array in the world you know we wanted to always to compete with the with the international uh, radio astronomy uh, scene and we wanted to be there ahead of everybody else which is the which is the correct thing to do which is a natural thing to do and all that and so this uh, array telescope consists now of 30 very novel and low cost uh, antennas which were patterned a little bit uh, like the uti telescope some aspect of uti telescope was taken and then some ingenious additions were made and that's how this became uh, the parabolic dish of uh, uti which was a very low cost dish for its size Uh, i don't think anybody can make that kind of a dish very easily elsewhere and the, we can see the pictures now uh, quickly uh, can we see this pictures yeah so this is uh, the uti telescope you can see the spokes the frames the parabolic frames of the telescope which are coming from the central yoke and these are like the bicycle uh, spokes if you flatten this you will find that that looks almost like a bicycle wheel see and so this has been made into a parabolic uh, shape and held there and you can see a number of dishes uh, here in this uh, birds eye view and we will just uh, go to the next slide where you can see uh, the gmrt in all its uh, focus uh, can you go to the next slide please yeah closer view and so this is how it looks uh, really from a little bit away from a hillock uh, near uh, narayanao 
where it is located. This is located in the north of uh, Pune, and we don't have time to go into why it was located in the north of Pune. You know, it is partly because of uh, low, uh, other low radio interferences of the kind that Jansky was investigating, and uh, and also uh, because it is a it is it is a stable platform and so on and this very interesting uh, uh, thing was done to make this telescope like this a low cost telescope it is actually what uh, professor gonsurup used to jokingly call a see through telescope so you can see uh, if you stand below this uh, mammoth instrument if you, you will look very tiny you can actually see a guy who is standing there at the, at the bottom of this uh, you look tiny and this will look very big after all this is like a football field uh, up there and but you will be able to see the sky through that and at night if you go and stand there you can see the stars in the sky so such see through design was required to keep the low cost because the wind passes through that and does not uh, put on a large amount of force or torque or anything like that and uh, we will skip all those things. So we will go to the next slide. I think I'm coming to the end of this talk. Uh, so it uses a very interesting uh, thing, which was coined by Vijay Kapahi as the stretcher mesh attached to a rope truss. Because Vijay also worked on this for quite some time uh, to give, uh, give, a, uh, give a shape to these uh, ideas. So in the next slide, we. Yeah, we can move on. Uh, can we move on? Yeah, you see now. You see that this is the uh, this is the invisible reflecting surface. You can see the reflecting surface on the left hand side. Uh, I am not able to show you this, uh, but it is. You can see a strip on a white strip, which is there, and that is a sunlight from this reflecting mesh. And uh, if uh, Nasri can point that, yeah, right. I think she's pointing the arrow there. Correct. That white strip, which a faint strip, which you can see on the surface, that is a reflecting mesh. And this is what uh, this is what is the actual parabolic mirror in the optical parlance. So this is what is reflecting the radio waves to the prime focus. And so we can go to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is the construction of GMRT. And uh, in the next slide, I would like you to concentrate. I, I just can we go to the next slide? Yeah, I, I just want you to see this, the, the very interesting uh, thing. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the details, but you can see that this telescope was made low cost because it is built around that central concrete uh, tower. It is actually built on site for every antenna. And you can see all those guys who are standing there, all those people who are standing there. So after the telescope uh, surface, parabolic surface has been completed and the meshes have been put on that, they have uh, four pulleys there. And with those pulleys, they are going to lift this by rotating the pulleys in synchronism. So a team was formed where each of the team there were some four people uh, on the pulley for rotating it. Uh, yeah, so we have four into four, 16 people. And there was a supervisor who are whistling. And everybody tuned to that uh, whistle. And they will rotate the pulley once. And so you need several pulleys. I don't have the video which shows how this telescope uh, is lifted up. The surface is lifted up. And then finally becomes uh, like what is shown in the next slide. Okay, we don't have time to go into all the details, but you can see that this is the finished product, finally. And all this happens within a day. Initially, it used to take uh, something like six to eight hours because people were very afraid of lifting this. And then as they gained, uh, uh, gained uh, much greater confidence, this could be done within an hour. And this could all be lifted up. And then it is, uh, it is welded up at the top and the whole structure becomes very stable. And then it can be rotated using the electric motors which are there. And then it can be computer controlled from the central uh, central station, computer station. So this is all computer controlled. This is all communicated through what are called optical fibers. 
again, we don't have time to go into the optical fiber scenario. It was introduced for the first time in India to, to put optical fiber for uh, communication and control of antennas. And that has become the norm these days everywhere. Okay, both analog and digital. Oops, this is an analog optical fiber communication. And I think this is the end of the end of the scene. Uh, the, the next slide only shows you the dedication, uh, dedication function. And then there is a, a there is a slide which shows the uh, shows the range of science which uh, which are possible by this. Can we go to the next slides? Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this is the this was done in 2001, dedicated by uh, Mr. Ratan Tata to the nation. And so GMRT has a range of uh, science possibilities. It is a very powerful instrument. It is completely steerable from end to end. You can rotate it by 360 degrees, and you can rotate it plus minus uh, 180 degrees in the in the in in what's called the declination. And azimuthally, you can rotate it uh, 360 degrees. So you can make map of various things. There is no time for showing all those things because I have already exceeded a lot of time, and uh, panelists have to come in. And so the next slide only shows you just a map of a galaxy, which uh, I and my students made, which is uh, where the spiral galaxies at the background and a radio contour is filled on the top. That radio contour is built from by GMRT uh, because you can make radio images only by looking at contours of electrical intensity. It is, it is the power which is coming in in the form, it is not visible to your eye, but it is visible Oops. through its electrical voltages. Through its electrical voltages, this becomes visible. And so that is the contour which is uh, mapped. Now you can give it false colors and all that. And you can make it very look very nice and very interesting and so on. And uh, there are people in this uh, panel who are experts in this, such things. Uh, like Dr. Divya Oberai and Rogesh Vardedekar. And there are scientists like uh, Dhruva Saikya and Amitav Sengupta who have analyzed lots and lots of data. And so that is the summary. We have come a long way in the radio astronomy research. India is a leading uh, partner in another major uh, telescope array which is coming up. It's called the Square Kilometer Array. It will take uh, it will take some years to complete this. The GMRT team are leading the work on control and monitor system for this square kilometer array, which will host thousands of such dish antennas and millions of low frequency antennas. And that will be the world's most sensitive radio telescope for the next 50 years. What this means is that the projects uh, of uh, radio astronomy, just like optical astronomy, are beginning to cost in terms of uh, billions of dollars or in terms of 10,000 crores or something like that. So they are becoming big. And so it needs the combined effort of many, many nations. And India is one of them. And it is leading in some areas. There are other countries uh, like uh, United States, China, and various others. And uh, that brings us to the close of this. And this was all possible because of the inspiring leadership of uh, Professor Gon Surub, who had retired by the time this, uh, the GMRT was commissioned. But nevertheless, he is the father figure for radio astronomy in India. And uh, he is, there are other great people also, <laughs> like Professor Radha Krishnan and various others. But uh, he was uh, really leading a huge team and he did a wonderful job. Thank you very much for your attention. Now the panelists uh, can discuss the science and other things because there is not much of time in this talk to develop. Mm -hmm. well Thank, Thank you, Professor Anand Krishnan, for taking us through the early phases of radio astronomy emerging in India yeah. under Professor Swaroop's leadership. We are also joined in the panel by Professor Gopal Krishna. Uh, he, he also has uh, this very long term association and participation in the very early um, emergence of radio astronomy in India. We have a panel uh, of radio astronomy colleagues. And uh, as I hand over to you, I I'll, uh, request Professor Gopal Krishna 
to uh, uh, to to give his tribute to Professor Swarup, and then we will be handing over to the panel. I will meanwhile check the, for the student questions, and I will be handing them over to the panel. Professor Gopal Krishna. Yeah. So let me begin by thanking you, Dr. Ratnashree, for inviting me to pay my homage to my academic mentor, Professor Govind Swarup. Uh, as you know, he left us exactly a week ago uh, at the age of 91 and a half. So in the next few minutes, as I have been asked, uh, I shall be sharing with you some of my personal reminiscences. And these are based on my uh, close uh, association uh, with the Professor Govind Saru uh, for 54 years. I met uh, Professor Roop in 1967 at TIFR. There was a year when pulsars were discovered. Uh, cosmic microwave background radiation had been already uh, discovered, but just two years before. And quasars had uh, been discovered five years earlier. So uh, this was the first time, I think, in the history of uh, astronomy when so many epoch-making discoveries uh, followed in such a quick succession. And that is why the decade of 1960s is uh, often called the golden age of radio astronomy. Uh, these astronomy uh, discoveries, particularly in radio astronomy, they were all in radio astronomy, uh, they brought the first Nobel Prizes to the entire field of astronomy. Now, uh, let me uh, walk down a bit, down the memory lane uh, to summer of 1967. Uh, I was 19 years then, and I had just passed out of the one year training course of the Atomic Energy Training School, which is now called BARC Training School. And I was looking uh, forward to join TIFR as a research associate. Uh, for this, I was asked to appear uh, before an interview committee, which was quite large, and it was all TFA professors. I remember uh, Professor Raja Ramana chairing the interview committee. And there were uh, several big weeks, like Professor Gaonkar, Professor Devendra Lal, and I think there were also Professor Yashpal and Professor uh, Chidamram. Uh, they all looked pretty serious with one exception, and that was a beaming face, beaming with smile. So at first, Professor Ramana asked me if I would be interested in doing solid state physics in his group. Uh, before I could even gather a response, the smiling face asked me if I had heard of radio astronomy. I said I had heard of Jordal Bank radio telescope. He then said his group was building an even larger radio telescope in Utakaman, in Uti. And then he asked me if I had been to Uti. I said, no, but I had heard about that beautiful hill station in South India. So with that, my interview was over. And <laughs> next day, I learned that I was going to be part of uh, Sorup's group and join the Uti telescope project. Thus began my research career in a field I knew practically nothing about. Now, uh, scrolling a little backwards, in 1960, with a PhD in radio astronomy from Stanford, Soru had a lucrative career ahead in the USA. Uh, as I said, that was the golden age of radio astronomy. So, Clearly, Govind Sarup was in the right place at the right time. His decision to return to India at that juncture almost seems like a fit of madness. And that too, when he had to start in India from a zero base in radio astronomy. Moreover, uh, in 1960s, as Professor Anand Krishnan said, India was still a technological desert. 
shifting to india would seem like wanting to be in a wrong place at the right time but go in sorrow had a rare passion and fire in the belly nothing would stop him it is interesting uh, to appreciate that in 1963 when uh, sorrow returned to india and joined tifr the concept of uti radio telescope was not yet, yet born in his mind as he told several of us the idea of uti radio telescope flashed in his mind for the first time when he was staring at the arabian sea from the tifr library in mumbai but baba was quick to seize the brain wave and he asked soru to raise a team rather than waste time on writing project report you see now these are soru's words so construction of uh, uti radio telescope began in 1966 and you have heard quite a bit already from professor anand krishnan who was very closely involved in the construction work and you have seen the picture of its majestic steerable antenna which is half kilometer long parabolic cylinder installed along a slope the average age of scientists and engineers working on that project was just 24 now efforts were being made to make the telescope ready in time to observe an important astronomical event in september 1969 what was the event on that day the moon was going to eclipse the center of our galaxy so for the next such event if you miss this one then one would have to wait for 18 years so for us then it was a do or die situation with a lot of hard work and many anxious days and weeks the team finally managed to get the telescope going in time and the important celestial event could in fact be observed now since i was involved in this i could share some more details of that which have some lesson the occultation was recorded on a running paper chart you just heard in the previous talk uh, in those days foreign exchange crunch was so severe that even tfr could not afford to import an electronic digitizer because it cost it $2000 and because of that several young researchers including vijay kapai and me spent a significant part of our phd years manually digitizing the lunar occultation and traces of hundreds of radio galaxies that we had recorded on paper charts today it looks absolutely inconceivable but that's how it started now what happened was <clears throat> around the time of the lunar eclipse of the galactic center the anosphere activity you know it intensified anosphere became very disturbed and the scintillations totally garbled up the occultation signals the paper chart really looked helter skelter and worthless so with a broken heart after all the hard work that was put in to make those observations uh, finally we dumped the charts unceremoniously in one corner of sarup's office and they lay there for a year or so <laughs> after sarup's uh, uh, you know frequent prodding i finally uh, took up those charts and digitized them manually as usual and on taking a 4 minutes you know average running average i found to my pleasant surprise that the scintillations were heavily smoothed out and therefore further analysis of those observations was possible and we did that and in fact we discovered a radio halo of synchrotron radiation around the center of our galaxy out of those data and this finding was reported in nature and further work on this led to the first two dimensional map of thermal and non thermal radio emission from the center of our galaxy 
So why I'm telling you this is that there was a lesson, early lesson for me, that scientific potential of an observation should not be overlooked or underestimated. The data which gave me my first paper in nature looked so hopelessly corrupted that today no student would cast a second glance at it. Uh, the second takeaway for me was that one should not be swayed by fashionable science. Rather try doing things that may hopefully become fashionable later. Following a similar credo, my colleagues and the UT group actually have published two dozen papers in nature. Now, Prof. Farooq, you know, uh, was a diehard optimist. He was always generous and projecting the work of his young students and engineers. However, there was one problem that we all faced, and that was that during a discussion, his hyperactive brain would abruptly keep switching from astronomy to electronics, to antennas, to structural engineering, or even something as mundane as soldering. He was an expert in all this. But it was really hard to keep him focused on any single topic during a discussion. And his uh, you know, unpredictable digressions often left his colleagues frustrated and exhausted. Um, However, for him, the topic seemed like a way of relaxing. This all the digression, you know, was like, uh, and uh, his, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The uh, I'm just finishing. So the UT telescope demonstrated that large experimental facilities could still be built in India despite our limited technological and human resource base. Uh, but it was really his second project, that was a giant meter wave radio telescope uh, that catapulted India to the world ranking in radio astronomy. And you have heard about it, you will talk just a while ago. Uh, and it continues to be the most powerful telescope in the wave band of its operation. Uh, it is hard to imagine that he mustered the courage to launch this ambitious project when he was close to 60 years. At that age, most of us hang our boots and slip into retirement. Similarly, the origin of Ayuka in Pune is also closely linked to GMRT. And it is not widely known that his very substantial spade work had prepared the ground for the establishment of ISIS. Uh, you know, for his numerous achievements and successes in science and many near misses also, um, several uh, numerous awards have been bestowed on him. The most notable ones are the Growth Labor Medal and the Fellowship of the Royal Society London. Another similar honor to him that is coming is that the preferatory note in the next issue of Annual Reviews of Astronomy and Astrophysics is going to be an article on Professor Solo. This is the first time such an honor has come to an Indian astronomer. For advancement of radio astronomy in India, Solo worked tirelessly for more than four decades. And he achieved more success than he would probably have imagined when he decided to return to India. Whenever the issue of reverse brain drain will come up, the memory of Professor Goen will shine as an example. And in his passing away, the country has lost not only an internationally celebrated scientist and a charismatic figure, but also an inexhaustible source of hope and encouragement to young minds all across India and beyond. With these words, I uh, end my ambassadorship. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gopal Krishna. And I would request um, Divya Yogesh if you could uh, mo moderate the discussion further and uh, tell the viewers about the further challenging directions GMRT has taken. There's a question from a viewer about recent applications of UT, and we could apply it also to the GMRT. And maybe if you could tell the viewers some of that. So sure. So maybe I'll say something about UT and then request Yogesh to say something about GMRT. So for the UT radio telescope, there are really uh, two major areas where it is playing a leading role. It still continues to be the world's largest steerable dish, even after 50 years uh, uh, of 
50 years after it was first made right and right now it has it is undergoing a very large upgrade which is actually going to improve its sensitivity and the patch of the sky it can look at at any given time by a very large amount by a very large fraction, making it a even more amazing telescope. So the two areas where it is making very interesting contributions these days are studies of something called pulsars. These are very rapidly rotating uh, stars, which are actually past their uh, hydrogen burning or nuclear fusion lifetime. And these are the end stages of stars. They're rotating as fast as once a second or actually even hundreds of times a second up to almost a millisecond. And they give out pulsed radiations. And because UTI is very sensitive, it is conducting many studies where you can look at individual pulses of these studies and also look at uh, various other properties of these studies. The other very remarkable area where UTI is actually uh, has been a leader globally for a long time is studies of uh, something called the solar wind. That's something which Professor Anand Krishnan worked on for a very large part of his career as well. So from the sun flows a very hot plasma. This plasma is so tenuous that you can't really see it with your eyes. But if you look at a very distant radio source through this plasma, something similar to uh, what happens when you see a star through the Earth's atmosphere a very similar phenomena takes place. The star is twinkling not because the starlight is actually changing. It is twinkling because of the turbulence in the ionosphere. In a very similar manner, the turbulence and the fluctuations in the density of the solar wind, the plasma flowing out from the sun, gives rise to fluctuations in the intensity of the radio light observed by the radio telescope. And by studying these, we can understand an enormous amount of detail about how much of solar wind there is there, in which direction it is flowing. Does it have any uh, something called coronal mass ejections, massive explosions which take place from the sun, which carry a lot of plasma out of the sun. And if directed towards the earth, they could actually have significant impacts on uh, our ability to communicate on our satellites, on the astronauts in the space station, and so on. So those are the two most interesting things which UT is up to these days. And with that, I'll ask Yogesh to talk a little bit about uh, the major science applications of GMRT. Uh, thank you, Divya, uh, for your comments on UT. I will talk a little bit about the GMRT. The GMRT has been operating as an open access telescope for about uh, 20 years now. Uh, what that means is any astronomer sitting in any country of the world who has a good scientific idea can propose to use the GMRT for his or her observations. Uh, this allows the telescope to be used uh, in innovative ways that we at the scientists within NCRA or within India may not have thought of. Uh, so, so far, we've had more than 500 uh, principal investigators from about 35 countries who have successfully proposed and have used the giant meter wave radio telescope for their analysis. If you look at the various scientific areas in which the GMRT, for which the GMRT has been used, it's really a very, very wide set, right from observations uh, of objects in our solar system uh, like observations of Venus, for example, in which uh, Professor Swaroop was uh, himself involved, uh, to more distant objects, uh, magnetic stars within our Milky Way, and also a large number of pulsars, which are rotating neutron stars within our galaxy, uh, have been studied uh, and new ones discovered uh, with the GMRT in uh, later years. As you go to more and more distant radio sources, uh, those outside our galaxy, they could contain a wide zoo of objects, quasars, uh, radio galaxies, and the like. And these can be uh, studied and new ones discovered uh, by a large number of surveys that have been carried out at the various frequencies of the GMRT. Uh, the largest such survey is something known as the TIFR GMRT Sky Survey which is a all sky continuum survey carried out at with the lowest frequency band of GMRT at 150 megahertz. There are all, this survey was completed a few years ago. Uh, 
there are also uh, other surveys to look for uh, new pulsars. Uh, so there is a GMRT high resolution sky survey uh, that e aims to find uh, new, new pulsars and has discovered several pulsars uh, over the last few years. Uh, the GMRT is also being used to discover uh, uh, neutral hydrogen uh, in extremely distant uh, galaxies. Uh, the, there is a recent work by led by a PhD student at NCRA, uh, which has discovered uh, 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 H1 from galaxies located billions, about 10 billion light years away uh, from us. There are studies focused on galaxy evolution that aim to study some, observe a small part of the sky uh, for a very long time so that one can attain very high sensitivities. Uh, these are deep fields. Uh, these are known as the deep fields. GMRT is also particularly well suited for the study of galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters uh, typically show radio emission in the form of what are called radio halos and uh, radio relics. And these are extremely faint. And, but they tend to become brighter if observed at low radio frequencies. And that is where GMRT's excellent sensitivity and the fact that it operates at low radio frequencies comes into play. And that allows us to uh, study uh, uh, these kind of cluster halos and relics even in fairly distant clusters. And this is a uh, work that is also being done extensively uh, with the GMRT. I think uh, yeah. that's all I have to say about yeah. GMRT science. There's some other aspects which I will come to absolutely later. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Yogesh. So maybe we'll go around the panel a bit and uh, request people to say a few words about perhaps a tribute they want to pay to Professor Swaroop or whatever else they want to share with the students on the call. So maybe I'll start with the Professor Amitabha Sen Gupta from NPL, National Physical Lab in Delhi. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think among the panel here, I'm the only one who is not a radio astronomer or an astronomer uh, by profession, but I somehow have had a very long association with Professor Govind Saroop. And the reason for that is this, that, you know, uh, as has been said, in both the addresses by Professor Anand Krishnan and also later Professor Gopal Krishna, that in viewing uh, distant stars, the si radio signals from distant stars, there are two things that uh, come into play. Firstly, the signals have to pass through the ionosphere, which is a, a, a layer above uh, the Earth at a height of something like 70 to 350 kilometers or so, uh, which has almost completely ionized plasma. And sometimes there are turbulences in these plasma, which causes scintillations and causes intense disturbances in these signals. So uh, we at NPL, our radio science division at NPL, has been doing a lot of work on studying these atmospheric simulation events and so on. Unfortunately, the location where we are, uh, namely the UT and GMRT, they are low latitude in the so-called uh, atmospheric anomaly zone, where these phenomena of atmospheric scintillations, etc., are very intense, very unpredictable, caused by so-called plasma bubbles and so on. So we have collaborated with Professor Swarup's group in understanding these phenomena better. So that was one aspect that uh, got us, uh, you know, in 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 touch with Professor Swarup and the uh, radio astronomy group uh, at UT and later in GMRT. That was one. And the second thing that was repeatedly mentioned by Professor Anand Krishnan is that if you want to view a distant star and want to do it with very high resolution, then what you need is a very large sized uh, antenna. Now, physically, to construct an antenna which is a thousand kilometer in diameter is impossible. So what one does is 
something which is called a very long baseline interferometry. So you actually have two physical antennas which are separated by very large distances and each of these makes the observations independently and then later on you bring in these sig signals and compare them or do correlations. Now, underlying these correlations, there is the fundamental requirement that the clocks uh, that time these events have to be absolutely accurately synchronized with each other. Otherwise, your synchronizing, uh, otherwise your correlations and making out anything out of the data would be absolutely meaningless. So we have to use very exotic clocks for these things. And that's the subject that I specialize in. These are so-called atomic clocks. These atomic clocks are, you know, I mean, on the face of it, very mundane looking physical instrument. That, but these are extremely accurate clocks. Uh, and if you run them uh, continuously, they would lose a gain in, in very simple terms. They would lose a gain something like a second in a million years or so. That's how accurate these are. They are extremely stable, accurate clocks. So the first time we used, uh, and it was Professor Anand Krishnan who and his team were doing a VLVI experiment in the mid-1980s. Uh, at UTI and that we collaborated with them and provided them with timing using atomic clocks and so on. So these are some of the things and now of course uh, the uh, GMRT and the UTI radio telescopes are equipped with atomic clocks with which they time their entire uh, setup. So these are, these are some of the things that we have been collaborating uh, with Professor Goni Saru. Uh, well, in addition, I mean, I'd not, not take uh, a long time. In addition, I think over the last 35 years or so that I've had my association with him, he has been extremely encouraging. And he has also encouraged us to start, uh, you know, encourage radio science activity in general in India. In recent times, we have started, a few of us have got together and started what is known as the Indian Radio Science Society, of which you know, which spans a wide spectrum, including radio astronomy, radio communications, radio metrology, and all kinds of stuff. So I, I, I think uh, by paying a glowing tribute to Professor Goen Saru, it's a big loss for the entire nation that he is no more with us. I thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sen Gupta. Yeah. Uh, we have a few more people on the panel who have not yet had an opportunity to say anything. So let me uh, go to them. We are just a few minutes in our allocated time. So I would have to request all of us to be brief. Uh, Professor Deshpande, may I ask you to uh, say whatever you would like to share with us here? Uh, we can't hear you. At least I can't hear you. Uh, I, I can't uh, hear uh, uh, Professor Deshpande either. Yeah. Okay. So maybe uh, while Professor Deshpande tries to uh, sort out the audio issues, may I request Professor Saikia to share what he would like to with all of us. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Dev. I'll try to be very brief because we are running out of time. Um, and just to start on a slightly personal note is that uh, I first met Govin during the famous summer school of 1976, uh, which he was one of the prime movers and organizers, and which motivated many of us to actually take up astronomy as a career, um, who are scattered across different institutions in different parts of the world ranging from Chanda Jog in IIC to Srinivas Kulkarni at Caltech. And what was what came through during the summer school was his just enthusiasm and passion for science. So that is something which, it is, this is a program largely for college students. Uh, this is something which we all need to inculcate because it's only when we are passionate about something, to do something 
that 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 we find our motivation to do so. So Govind was one of those persons driven by the passion to answer big questions of the day. And he not only did that, he mentored and got together teams of people to do that who have all become leaders in different fields, um, internationally renowned. So the ability to get together teams, the ability to mentor people, the ability to work together, to always question, query, and be passionate about your work are the distinguishing marks of Govind. Uh, I joined the UT, uh, the Radio Astronomy Group in 77. And as many have mentioned, his warm smile, his, uh, you know, it just sticks with you for, you know, generations or as long as you're alive. You know? The warmth, the care and support which he gave many of us as we progress along our careers. And as many of us have said that, uh, you know, he's just so full of ideas. I remember the first morning I, I landed up on the 15th of August, which was Independence Day celebrations are going on. He called me to his office on the 16th. And he spent about two to three hours talking about the various topics. It was not just one, but many. So you were just spoiled for choice as to what you could do with a telescope, what you could do with science. And as a young student, one of the most motivating factors was to see Govind in a very modest office, thinking about science at the frontiers, you know. It was not the environment of many of our institutions of higher education, where there is just so much of hierarchy that you get rather really don't get to interact with the leaders of the field. You see them from a distance. So these are these are aspects of Govind's life, which you know, uh, which I would like to sort of highlight to the student community. Grow up with passion, grow up with humility, try and mentor people, hold each other's hands uh, to do great things, not only for yourselves but for the country as well. And there were small traits which were which actually touched me over the years that you know today you write a letter to an official you never probably get a reply if you get it it'll be months later but govind was a person who promptly responded to when you wrote to him whether it be a scribble on something which you had written just to share his thought or maybe an elaborate long mail or or maybe as i mentioned earlier just a whatsapp message in his older days the last one i received from him was in july of this year and that that culture of just responding and eager to learn, eager to discuss, eager to teach are characters which have not only contributed to science, but in a wide variety of things. And the ICERs, which have been mentioned, is just one example. The Joint Astronomy Program, he was also one of the initiators. The early classes were held in the TIFR Center. And what one must also realize that today, when institutions work together, we talk of MOUs, we talk of all kinds of things. But, but UTI was an example where Govind opened the doors to another great stalwart, Radha Krishnan, Sana Chandrasekhar Venkat Raman, who was the director of the Raman Research Institute. And the two institutions got together, probably without any argument, any sort of formal arrangement, but just to do science, to discuss science. Rad used to often drive up in his car, and he was once seen, you know, repairing his cars, <laughs> you know, just under the car itself. And one of our engineers gave him a bit of advice, not knowing who he was. And, and though that was the culture of egalitarianism, of working together, of pushing the frontiers of science, and Govind was the one who was the leader of this team, mentoring us all, encouraging us all, and taking us forward. So many aspects to him, it's just not just telescope building. There are people who joined as observers in the Institute, but grew up to be leaders in the field today. So the, the paths of social mobility, uh, the path of professional growth, these are all things which are opened up by the culture of these institutions. So these are aspects also which you youngsters, as you're growing up from your college days, tomorrow you'll be leaders in different fields, are aspects of an individual who has risen to such greatness is something that would be worth uh, paying a bit of attention to. Uh, I will close now because we are really short of time, but uh, our discussion of regards to Govind and his legacy will definitely live on for a long time to come. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Saikia. It's in the, I mean, he had just so many facets to him that it's very hard to put them down in a few words. And what I also re have been realizing in the past few days that all of us feel that he had special relationships with us, right? For with each one of us, and that is such an amazing feeling to have. Uh, may I request Professor Deshpande to share with us what he would like to? Sorry, Desh, no audio still.
Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, just say something again. I thought I heard something from you. No. Yeah. Sorry, Professor Deshpande. We are not. I'm sorry for the technical troubles we are having. I'm sorry that uh, we're not able to hear Professor Desh. Uh, Yogesh, you had said that there was something you wanted to share. Could you make it quick, please? Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's one aspect of his work uh, which has not yet been mentioned is that he was very passionate about training the next generation. And uh, Professor Anand Krishnan talked about how he played an important role uh, in, uh, in the setting up of the ISERS, the Indian Institutes of Science, Education, Research. But he was also very concerned that the in the area around the GMRT, there should be some something that the villagers get back from the GMRT telescope. And about a decade ago, he set up uh, a foundation uh, known as the Kodad Rural Science Center. And the work of this uh, of this trust was to uh, sort of encourage uh, the science related activities in the school uh, in the village school of Kodad. And he has been absolutely tireless in this pursuit. And thanks to his efforts and his ability not to take no for an answer for anything that he wants done, uh, this Kodad Rural Science Center with which Professor Anand and Professor Oberoi are also involved, uh, we've managed to do a lot of good work in the village in which the GMRT is located. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Professor Vardekar. One last try for Professor Deshpande. Let's see if we can hear you. Yeah. I'm afraid not. Uh, he may be muted. Uh, uh, Dave, yeah. just check if he's muted. Not from the. He doesn't seem okay. muted on my console. He doesn't seem muted on on his uh, okay. window as well. Yeah. Uh, Ratnashree, if you can hear yeah. us, uh, maybe is there something you can try on the console to see if there is an issue there? Yeah. Uh, no, even here it is. Uh, maybe what I will do, uh, I if I can, uh, Desh, if you could uh, come in on phone and then, uh, okay. but there will be there will be there will be a lot of audio issues. Yeah, be, I would yeah. also be requesting. Uh, 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 for, uh, we we would be having continued sessions post this, and perhaps Desh, I could take a uh, session with you sure, yeah. just following this. Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think I, that. I, I, so I, I believe that now brings us to the question. close of of this session. Uh, Ratnashree, may I request you to uh, be with us for a while? And uh, if yes. there are any questions to be taken, maybe I can request. Yeah, there was there was just uh, uh, one question which I thought maybe we could kind of end with, and. Uh, ah. uh, Yes. OK. So uh, the question is on your screen, can GMRT be used to uh, study dark matter and dark energy? So by definition, dark matter is matter which does not give out any radiation. Probably the general belief is that it doesn't interact with, the, with electromagnetic radiation either. However, there are ways, if, if there are other things which you can trace which are being impacted by dark matter, for example, if the amount of hydrogen which you see in a galaxy, if its dynamics is being controlled by the presence of other mass there, uh, dark matter is supposed to interact primarily via gravitation. So we see evidence of uh, dark matter using the GMRT, using its ability to study the 21 centimeter line, red shifted or otherwise, from the galaxies which it uh, which it studies. Uh, in fact, Professor Vardekar, who's here on the panel, can probably elaborate on that. Yeah. So, so by studying the rotation curves of galaxies is uh, is the way in which you can study the distribution of dark matter within the galaxy. And this is this has been done not just with the GMRT but with several other radio telescopes. Radio telescopes have the advantage that uh, neutral hydrogen in gas-rich galaxies can be distributed very far away from the center. So you can trace the rotation of the galaxy to a much larger extent than what you can do with, uh, with just optical observations. Uh, I can also comment a little bit about uh, dark energy. 
uh, unlike uh, dark uh, matter, dark energy is a much uh, harder problem to solve because the kind of observations that you uh, need to make in order to trace the evolution of the dark energy uh, are uh, uh, need to be made on very distant objects and which are inherently very faint and so on. So there, the role that a radio telescope can play is, is much less, but it can definitely, by complementing observations made in the optical, uh, radio telescopes can also be used for studies of, of dark energy, provided they're sufficiently sensitive. And the next generation telescope that we are starting to build, which was mentioned once before, the square kilometer array uh, will be the telescope that will really enable us to make progress on studies of dark uh, energy. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Yogesh. Yeah. Over to you, Ratnashree. Yeah. yeah with, uh, with this, I think we would uh, conclude uh, this session. Uh, thank you. My deepest gratitude to all of you who, have, uh, who are here uh, in this uh, tribute session. And um, uh, we uh, there is a thought that perhaps we would be having continued sessions in future with uh, standalone lectures and so on. And I'm going to request all of you for those sessions as well. And we will be concluding the session today. Thank you for all the panelists. And uh, so here, uh, it's a goodbye to all and the viewers. The, yeah, yeah, to the audience as well for joining Thank us. You. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you to all the audience. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.